Well, hi everyone. My name is Carrie Burgess and I'm with the Saskatchewan Tourism Education Council Department of Tourism Saskatchewan. And we are pleased to partner with Zoo for this webinar, Adapting Your Business, a Strategic Approach. As the unofficial digital spokesperson in Saskatchewan since the early 2000s, Albert Jamie has watched the online world evolve from static websites to the digital ecosystem we're in today. His fresh and dynamic attitude belies his seasoned perspective in matters of business, strategy, and creative work. Albert helps organizations navigate through digital transformation from problem identification all the way through to solution and execution. Whether you're knee deep in information architecture or looking to understand why Pokemon Go is about to change your job description, Albert will be there. He has consulted on many large and complicated projects with clients, including SaskTel, the Government of Saskatchewan, Farm Credit Canada, Connexus, the CFL, ING US, the Saskatchewan Teachers Federation, Sask Energy, and the City of Saskatoon. So please welcome Albert Jamie. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, hopefully everybody's seeing my slides. You're still seeing it there, Carrie? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so I can't see anybody but you, Carrie, right now, so I'm not too sure who's all online, but I'm gonna make sure that uh, I'm treating you all with the amount of energy that I should be. Um, as Carrie said, I am Albert. I am the strategy director at Zoo. And welcome to the show. We're gonna be doing uh, like maybe a 30 to 40 minute talk and hopefully opening up to some questions. Hopefully I can figure out how to like see more of the faces on my Zoom chat, but. This almost feels like a rehearsal because I'm just talking to myself. So um, basically, uh, I'll just kind of explain a little bit of who I am and maybe a little bit about Zoo, and then we'll get right into it and hopefully giving you some ideas on how you can apply these, these processes to your, to your job. Um, I'm the director of strategy at Zoo. We'll talk about that in a second, but uh, this is more who I am inside or outside of work. I am, I keep saying I'm the ambassador for tourism Saskatchewan, the unofficial one. I feel like I've just toured every corner of this province outside of Uranium City, but um, you can always find me just dipping my boat into multiple different channels of, and bodies of water in Saskatchewan um, from subcurrent originally. So I feel like I have a good kind of understanding of the northern part, middle part, and southern part of Saskatchewan. So, um, so hopefully this is relative to all of you in tourism. Um, just a little bit about Zoo, as Carrie mentioned, we are a digital and strategy, a digital solution firm that builds products and services for different companies. Um, that's just a mouthful, but essentially we were just a website company in the nineties. And eventually as the internet grew from zero to a hundred, we turned into this kind of boutique agency. We're still not like a massive IBM or Accenture. We're still this sort of, I still think we're kind of punk rock in our industry because we do like heavy duty technical projects, but we still kind of bring it with this little soul and flair that a lot of the big organizations don't bring but if you're in Saskatoon uh, we're located right across the street from the Mead police station on 25th on Pacific Avenue and feel free to come over and take a tour and and if we were in person we'd be in the experience room doing this workshop together but because of all the minor cold season that we have uh, we are stuck at home and hopefully we can just make this just as good as in person uh, as I said earlier we came from the world of websites so the stuff we were building were you know applications, mobile, um, big websites for large enterprise organizations and had to slough through a lot of different um, case studies and departments to fully understand what they wanted. So this is why our departments are set up as strategy, design and technology where everything starts with strategy. And so today we're not gonna talk so much about the technology or design side, we're just gonna talk about strategy and hopefully uh, sharing a little bit of how our business strategy can apply to your uh, small, medium, or even large organization. And I would say that this is sort of the temperament and the mood of everything right now is, I don't know how many more existential kind of conversations you could be having with yourself in the last four months, definitely working from home. Just everything to me is so, uh, something to be debated. And we look deep into business. We look deep into ourselves during these four months. And for us, we're, we know that we're not immune to the, the economy right now. And it's something that's forcing us to transform our organization. Because unfortunately, we're not, we're not this person. We're, 
we're not lucky enough to be one of those organizations as the majority of businesses aren't the ones who have succeeded quite a bit in these uh, in these times and that's why i said that everything is kind of on the table and whether you're feeling that sentiment it's like yeah it's uncertain right now we don't know how much we have to change now or permanently but everything should be evaluated from your business to your business strategy to your business model to your products your services i know we're going through the same thing and so i could have just as easily named this uh presentation, reimagining your business, a human centered approach, because that's essentially what we're going to be talking today is like, how do you reimagine elements of your business or your whole thing? And where do you start? Because most of us are not those really disruptive companies that disrupt ourselves when we, the industry is not even telling us to do it. We just constantly want to push. Most of us are probably pushed into this, not proactively, but more reactively. And it's something that we have to do because there's all this uncertainty and it's not a comfortable place to be. And you'll hear me talk about the idea of human centered approaches and user centered approaches. It's an easy term to kind of understand saying, oh, obviously you just have to design around the users, but it's really, really hard to put into practice. And hopefully I can give you some steps on how companies who are customer obsessed or customer focused really go about uh, doing this. So, that's really the intro of this presentation. And the, the model we're gonna be looking at is really the framework of design thinking. And I, I talk about it, it's more important than ever. If you do some research on the term design thinking, you'll see so many articles written about Fortune 500s and why are they uh, leaning towards design thinking to be more agile and how are disruptive companies leaning on design thinking. Uh, it's a polarizing topic. It's uh, something that we've kind of embedded our, our strategy department in. And that's because we're at this juncture in business where digital transformation is happening and it's forcing us to think differently because if you're doing a big CRM or ERP or giant legacy replacement, um, it's going to kind of push on all the other departments in your organization to beg the question of how much do we need to change? Or maybe that change is driving these big software projects. But this is a, maybe a time to open up the polls. So we have two polls that we're gonna ask and tourism and carry tourism is going to do it. And the first poll we have is within what time frame do you have plans to invest in a digital strategy? Do you have no plans? Is it within zero to six months, one year or two years plus? And whether that's doing a website or whether it's looking at your entire digital technical footprint, um, Carrie, you might wanna show how you can um, open up the polls. Oh, there it is. This is new to me. So we'll give you guys, you know, 10 to 15 seconds to think, oh, this is uh that's question number two. Sorry. Question <laughs> preview of question number two, the, it's the second poll. There you go. What time frame do you have plans to invest in a digital strategy? Okay. So it looks like in the next six months, the, the majority of you guys are thinking of looking at, you know, a digital strategy or making some investment in more technical um, areas, which is, which is good. Uh, I wonder how many are related to what's happening right now. Is it just sort of a wake up call or is it, is the, is the timing right for you guys to start investigating this? Because with going into a digital strategy, I will say that it is going to be the best business conversation you will have. You will start, you know, asking questions around your brand. You'll ask questions around your mission and vision and your purpose um, and understanding whether you need to transform in any way. So that's cool. So that's poll number one with success. Thank you very much, Carrie. But before we start talking about real transformation, I think it's important to understand how we got here before I start talking about the steps in design thinking. I think it's really uh, key for us to see what happened and then we can go, okay, so this is proof that we need to be disruptive. Because if you look at the last 10 years, for example, we know what happened. The internet literally went from zero to hundred overnight. It seems like everybody's a power user. But if you think back to like 1995, like when the zoo kind of got founded or even like early 90s when the internet first came out this whole wave of the future 
it was really unknown, like how it was going to impact us. It was really one way, right? The communications were you go to the website, you get some information, and then you move on to your merry way. But, you know, fast forward 20 years, what we're doing is we're using this as part of our life. We're integrating it like these billion dollar pieces of software every day. And we're not really understanding what it's actually doing to our society sociologically because it's changing everything. It's changing our behavior. Um, it's raising the bar of expectations from service. You can imagine these are the people that will say, I never want to walk into a bank. I never want to call somebody. I never want to have to deal with a customer service representation. And that is, everything should just be handled for me because all these other really amazing applications are putting the pressure on us to make better experiences. And then you combine all of that. You combine all of that with what's happening with software and the advancements in internet of things where you're connected at every single moment. It's only gonna get more invasive to your business and something that it needs to be taken seriously. And it's, it's even disrupting our industry. Obviously we're in it and man, it's super frustrating being a consultant in here because you always have to see what's next and what we're doing last year is already out of date but something like this for example like where you just talk to something and it does it for you this is a whole different type of experience that we as user experience designers have to um, be faced with our designers are good interface designers but what happens when there's no interface in the future right when you just ask for a pair of jeans to be delivered to your house and it happens there's no interface there's no button there's no like there's nothing this is something that we have to take in consideration that's gonna disrupt graphic design as we know it. So again, always paying attention to what's happening and seeing, is this a threat to our industry? And I don't like to belabor, you know, the, the, the sad news of the world all the time, but I think sometimes we need to take a little bit history lesson from these organizations that kind of skipped out on, on the, the opportunities that they had. And, you know, Blockbusters is a perfect example. We know exactly the story of that. They had a chance to buy Netflix for $50 million and they laughed them out of the boardroom. And that time Netflix was just a DVD kind of mail order system. But because they laughed them out of the boardroom, Netflix went on to do what Netflix did and they just dominated. They ended up obviously wiping out the entire video rental market almost overnight, it felt. But they didn't stop there. Netflix obviously had this machine and heartbeat going that pushed them to try to dominate the content world. So now they're winning Grammy or they're winning Emmys, they're winning Oscars. And it's really changing and up, up, uprising, uh, uh, upheaving the entire industry, I would say. Another good example, and probably I would say even sadder than Blockbuster, is the whole idea of Sears. And we're all familiar with if you see Saskatoon or Regina, the giant uh, watermark that remains on the brick wall of what used to be Sears. Um, Sears is obviously a perfect example of a digital transformation that just never happened, though they tried. But they were definitely beat by a very apparent um, prototype called Amazon. At the time, it was just a book delivery prototype. That's all they did was it, they knew what they wanted to do, but they wanted to get it right. So the delivery system was just prototyped to deliver books. But the problem I have with Sears, which I think is almost very, very sad to see, is that Sears had that 130 year head start. And what do I mean by that is that we all know what Sears's big model was, was the, the mail order catalog. And having this mail order catalog system comes with a plethora of systems that are in place, a massive logistical system that they had from warehousing across the North America. And they figured out how to do that. To me, that's really complicated. What's minor compared to that is developing a good user interface to replace the catalog system. They had the delivery system already in place, but for some reason they couldn't put two and two together and connect the dots and to invest into what they needed to invest in. And the rest is history. You see what Amazon did. And Amazon is a, is a crazy story, evil or not. They're, they're doing a wild things where they, you know, they're going to every industry. They obviously bought Whole Foods and they're creating a system where you can just grab your food and go. You don't even have to like scan or anything. It just knows what you took off the shelf magically. Amazon's goal is to go to the moon. And if you think about that organization, if they're going to the moon, I'll probably bet on them to figure out how to drop ship jeans to my, or khaki pants to my house with a drone. Like that sounds very easy to them. So 
eventually they are going to kind of go to all these different industries and they are going to come for our industries. We're getting a lot more calls lately with clients saying, you know, we just have to gear up for when Amazon comes to our industry. And I didn't remember hearing that 10 years ago, but within the last two, three years, this is an actual real discussion. If you hear and listen to consultants and, and authors and experts talk about how to guard yourself against this revolution or uprising, it's that the two important things is really keeping up with the digital age and creating customer experiences that matter. So really, if you think about those two keywords as digital and experiences, which is something that we're going to be talking about today. It's not all bad news. I don't like always, you know, harping on the, the Sears and the blockbusters of the world, but I like talking about companies who have disrupted themselves after being in business for decades. And that's what we're, we're going after, right? We're trying to be an incumbent that has been able to buck the trend and not be taken over by some new disruption. A company that I can think of is Domino's. Um, a lot of people might not think of them when it comes to technology, but they've really repositioned their whole brand to be a technology company first that just happens to make pizza. And that cultural shift in their organization has really helped them kind of, you know, disrupt themselves. And so they try all these different omni-channel experiences. And for them, you know, tossing a million dollars into a research project is probably nothing, but they try things and, you know, some are hits like the Domino's tracker is like a huge hit. When you order pizza through their app, it has a very accurate tracking system to know who's cooking your pizza, who's putting it in, how long it's going to be there. And finally, when it gets out on delivery, something that is just, it sounds like a miracle when it comes to uh, having control over your pizza order or else delivering to any hotspot again, why can't they? They know where you are through your location on your phone. So it just makes sense that they should be able to deliver to any of those spots. But they also try different things and they miss. And that's the beauty about this sort of kind of prototype agile world that we live in is that you try to spend a little bit just to see if it sticks rather than spending, you know, years and millions and millions of dollars on something that doesn't hit with the customer. So they've done the emoji ordering where you can just send a, a pizza through Twitter and then you get a pizza delivered to you. And you know, that wasn't a huge hit, but it's, it shows that they're trying and it was probably not a huge expense to try to get going. So we're, what we're seeing in Saskatchewan, sometimes you might think, oh, well, this is just too advanced and we're not as digital in Saskatchewan, but what we're starting to see are these organizations and enterprises kind of understand the process and, and embrace failure and embrace agile prototype natures of, of development. And we're starting to see that. The only issue is that sometimes we're, we're also held down by executive management. And I don't want to harp on eight people of certain age. It's just a, it's a mindset sometimes when business is going so good um, that sometimes usability and good customer experience is simply a line item versus something that actually takes so much time. If making an Airbnb or something was so easy, everybody would be doing it, but it's the time and the effort and the respect that you have to give. I give this as an example, and it's, it's the physical world. When you're building a cruise ship or the Taj Mahal or the Venetian in Vegas, you walk into these things and you physically see how big they are. They, they're, they're very impressive in size. So you automatically think that there's thousands of workers and that this is a very expensive thing I'm in. Um, but what we don't do is that same feeling doesn't wash over us when we're using Amazon on our iPhone to order like, you know, anchor bolts for your picture frame. You just don't think that that experience should be in line with it because it feels like this. It's tiny and it's supposed to be invisible. Like our job as designers are supposed to be making the experience invisible so you don't notice it. And because of that, sometimes we don't understand ourselves when it comes time to design these things and we, we underpower it and then we create software that looks like this. And this is true screenshots of software for hotels circa 2020. It's sad because this is not what we would want, but yet this is what we, ex we ex expect, right? And you'd imagine that there's a manager who teaches you how to use the software, how to book it, and everybody's familiar with this type of software. And some of the newer software, the POS systems are getting better, but there's still a lot of this legacy stuff that uh, does not feel like this. Because this is modern software, yet we, we think of it as a website. But this is modern software, and we're all familiar with who this company is. They've allowed me, if I owned a 30-unit condo plex somewhere, they've allowed me to create you know, and rent it out without any instructions. 
think about that. Like, I don't have to have a manager tell me how to F8 out of this thing or, you know, how to print something off. It's, it's all super intuitive. And that's because Airbnb fancies themselves as a design company. They don't say they're an accommodations company. They're a design company first, which means they're designing everything and testing everything around the customer. So if there's anything to, to learn from all these uh, stories I'm talking about is that we must work hard so the users don't have to. So if you're creating a new service or new product, make sure you do what's the proper steps in order to, to honor your, your users or your customers. And I'll, I'll continue to say this from the rooftops is that if you notice that something's hard to use or an experience is bad, it's typically because the design designers on the back end didn't work hard enough and we rushed it and we put more of the onus on the, the, the customer and the user to do more of the work. So remember this, we must work hard so our users don't have to. Uber is a great example of a company that's done that. They've created this system that's obviously very magical because if you thought about in the 80s how we would transform the, the taxi industry you would be thinking of, I don't, all these things, like the pain points are, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't, I need to know where I am at all times. I want to know how much it's going to cost. I want to be able to transfer money wirelessly, even though you didn't know what that meant in the eighties, all of this stuff needed to be uh, aligned. And what happened was all of this stuff happened. It aligned, the stars aligned and Uber put it together. And obviously, you know, your the future is being written as we speak right now in, in the fight against the taxi consortium. But what we'll notice is that Uber did not just revolutionize the entire step and the entire process of the customer journey because 95% of the time when you're in the back of an Uber, it feels exactly the same, doesn't it? It feels exactly the same as a, a cab ride, aside from maybe a couple like uh, candies in the back just so they get a positive rating. It feels largely the same. Cars rarely feel any better or worse. And that's because Uber said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to transform it by focusing on these things called magic moments. The magic moment was the friction at the beginning before you call and the end when you're leaving. And they said, what can this do to alleviate those two things? It can locate us. We can, we can pay. We don't, we can rate people. We can keep a democratized system. So then people get, are, are motivated to behave well. They focused on that and it just happened to revolutionize the whole industry. So I'm asking the people who attend to think about our magic moments in our business and go, what are the key moments that truly matter that we can design or disrupt? And the way to do that is to really act like a startup. Because I think design thinking is built to challenge conventional thinking. You know, we talked earlier this morning about digital transformation, but it's more just about transformation. Again, I keep saying that digital, don't even have to worry about it. It's just organizational transformation is happening and acting like a startup is important. So this is where we're gonna get into talking about the steps and maybe you guys can take a few steps from here and apply it to your own business. So the approach, we, any company that comes to us and says we're a little bit lost or we need to rethink something, we come in and we start applying the design thinking approach. And a lot of people ask, well, what is design thinking? First of all, terrible name. It has the word design in it. So it, people automatically think that it has something to do with design. It isn't. It's just a practical approach to find a creative solutions to problems that inspired by the traditional design methods so that you don't have to be a designer to use or understand. Meaning that we're using how designers think to apply it to regular problems in our business. And for us, it's just an approach to problem solving. Nothing more than that. If you Google it, this is what you're gonna see. Again, don't try to understand any of it. A lot of it is just consulting BS that tries to like overcomplicate something that is fairly simple to understand, hard to implement, but easy to understand. So what we like to do is simplify it even more for our users and our customers to understand that there are five major steps in design thinking. It really is empathizing, defining, ideating, prototyping, and testing. We like to use plain language all the time. Really the first step is just doing some research then identifying those insights and, and defining what the problem is. From there, coming up with some ideas. No way to glorify that one other than just come up with ideas. And then try them out quickly and test them with the users. So again, classroom material. This is stuff that everybody should be able to understand, but it's putting it in practice. So this is the other diagram that I'll probably go back to before, again, which is the 
classic double diamond approach, which is all about divergence and convergence. So you'll notice that we're going to go wide with the problems, then narrow in on what their key problems are, go wide with the solutions on those few problems, and then kind of zoom in on the ones that actually matter. And I'll explain how we use this throughout the, the approach. And a lot of questions, a lot of people ask us, well, what does it look like? What does design thinking look like in practice? It's, there's no like magic sauce. It's a lot of workshops. It's a lot of getting uh, cross-functional teams together. Like in this photo, we have engineers, we have miners, and we have designers all sitting together and typically like talking out their ideas. So nobody is an expert in anything. Some people have more expertise, but it's really everybody is kind of treated equal at these things where they're trying to show us how they use this giant boring machine and all the problems with it. And the engineers typically are the ones programming it, but they need a designer to figure out how do you design it around how it's being used. So we had to get them to show us how they use it from the very minute to step on the machine to the minute they, they log out. And then we needed to kind of understand their mental model, understand what are the key problems, key challenges, even getting them to sketch what works for them, how they would look at data, what would make more sense for them. And eventually that it's taken by our team to try to prototype and, and create like quick ideas around what they just told us. So typically a lot of times it looks like that where it's just a lot of uh, cross-functional teams sitting and meeting together. So the first step in this whole thing, which is the easy part is doing some research. And it's the fun part because you get to just sit there and be an open book and learn. So let's talk about user research. In our world, we're not a huge market research fan, I mean company, but we are huge proponents, proponents to user-centered research, making sure that we study the user and study their motivations. Why is that? Well, because I think a lot of companies are doing it wrong. I don't think a lot of companies budget to talk to their customers and truly understand. They, they make a lot of assumptions. And you see this all the time where you're on hold for 45 minutes, but they actually don't care about you, right? But they're just saying that. So I say, despite how often it's said, co companies rarely know what it means to be truly customer focused. A lot of times you'll hear, oh, I'm on the customer experience team. And I go, oh, okay, well, what's your strategy? And they're like, oh, we're just the rebranded marketing division. And you're like, oh, okay, great. <laughs> and, and which makes me kind of sick of seeing these things. We hear it all the time. Oh, customer satisfaction is number one. Like customers are number one. Our customers are our number one asset. And then you ask them, what are they actually doing to like uphold themselves to that? And then they're like, well, nothing really. <laughs> so here's how. When you're researching, I like to break it down into four different things. And whether you want to budget for all of this or just a little bit at a time, that's fine. The first thing is just at least know about your user whether it's through analytics, whether it's through data, whether it's through research or other white papers that you can find online of target demographics of immigrants between 18 and 35. There's lots of papers, lots of things you can even pay for or just to read online for free on the internet. The second thing is a little bit more immersive where you're going around them. So your frontline workers, uh, talk to them, ask them questions about what they think of their customers. Really important to ask not just frontline workers, but people on the call centers um, and people who've had any sort of relationship with your customers. Then it's with them. So obviously this is talking with them, interviewing them, observing them, getting them to do some testing, bringing them in for purposes, uh, doing a survey with them. And finally is being them. Have, when's the last time you put your customer hat on and walked through your process or tried to go through your own website to check out um, and almost wipe the slate clean on your memory on, and try to look at it through a new user's lens. That's really important as well. So just a quick overview of all the different engagement methods and there's various ones and I'm sure everybody in business has had some experience doing something here. If you look in the bottom left, uh, intercepts, that was, those are kind of interviews that you do right after a customer or a user has gone through the process. And so it's fresh on their mind. So whether you've been stopped at an airport to do a survey, that's more of an intercept. While a diary is giving somebody a, a tool, now people use mobile apps to just diarize their whole experience for whether it's something like a stay at a hotel for the entire weekend, they can kind of diarize all the experiences that they have. Safaris, that's when you're being the customer and you're going and putting your Safari hat on. And then there's like card sorting, user testing, a lot of different things that we use. Sometimes it's more specific to digital channels. 
But user engagement methods are really, really uh, important during the research phase. We love interviews. One basic thing, if the client doesn't have budget, we'll always say, like, it doesn't matter. You need to have one to five to 10 to 25 interviews with your customers so we can start seeing patterns and, and engage, gauging body language. It's funny, we actually, like in our training programs, we use a case study about COVID shopping experiences. So the COVID shopping experience, we interview users on, so what's different now? Like, how are you feeling? And the whole panel of trainees get to listen and make notes. And it's always about what's your new grocery routine now that the, the grocery stores are all crazy. And this is like a few months ago, um, which is bringing me to the next poll. And the next poll is all about are you using, are you currently using digital tools to communicate COVID slash sanitation messaging to your users? Yes or no? So I'll give you guys 10 seconds to answer that and we can kind of see the results. All right. All right, so that's good. Everybody is using digital tools to communicate sanitation messages to your users. Perfect. Um, if you weren't, um, I think that's just table stakes now. And when we talk to customers, I'm sure you guys have heard this online or people phoning, the, the common themes are like about hours. What are you doing to ensure safety? What are the new rules? Are you at full capacity? Are you adapting to what Health Canada recommends? There's so many basic things that need to be communicated and uh, Tourism Saskatchewan wanted to reiterate the importance of doing that. So it's good to see everybody is actually still following it. For us, we look at this as opportunities. If you aren't totally savvy and you feel like you just don't have much to say, this COVID uh, communications gives you a plethora of different ideas for creative content if you want. Um, you can spin this in ways to help create more marketing material if you wanted to as well, not just emergency protocol PR stuff. You could be doing daily updates, you could be doing how to's or short videos of your staff cleaning and having responses to questions. So many different things to uplift or to inform. Uh, so just maybe treat this as less of a crisis and maybe more of an opportunity, maybe something that your, your competitors aren't designing for. Um, at Zoo, we just do a lot of different communications and our remote we just did a remote survey to all our workers at home and then we just published in a unique way like all the different responses and showing people that you know our culture is still strong and and kind of saying that everybody watched tiger king and how many sourdough loaves have been baked during this whole time so just we had a little fun with it we had a little spare design time so we wanted to show people that you know during covid there's still opportunities to design something that's interesting Okay, we're still in the research mode. So remember, doing more research means understanding your users. So we'll make personas now. And whether you do target market segmentation, we, we call them personas because we like to assign like kind of faces and a kind of fictional stories to these people. And it's important to look at these personas through their lens and making sure we pick a few of them and, and try to optimize the design for them. And personas, can look like this where they have quotes and motivations, a little bio of people. Sometimes they can be a little less uh, visceral where it's more to do with just the, the, the styles of uh, their behaviors and characteristics and hashtags. This is one that we just did for a bank. It's really important to pick a few. Don't pick 15 personas because that's just designing for everybody. And we know this, if you design for everybody, you design for nobody. So pick a few personas, design around them, optimize the solution around them, and you'll start realizing that all your other customers are probably going to be hit as well. Okay. Also in the design phase, we talk about mapping. And this is very, very applicable to the tourism industry is journey mapping, understanding your customer's journey from the beginning to end, and not just the time they use your product before and after as well. Um, typically looks like something like this, where you have different phases, different activities for your customers to go through. And you can do this as a group and you can look at pain points and opportunities. You can see what it looks like in workshops. It's just a lot of post-it notes and everybody gets a chance to talk about all the steps and phases of your customer journey. And if you get, want to get fancy, you can make artifacts out of them and share them with the organization and just saying that right here, this is our magic moment. This is where we need to focus. 
And journey maps are important because they're based upon one person's kind of point of view. Typically you would interview somebody and go, okay, let's map this person's exact journey just so it's kind of a story we can tell the rest of the staff. Another type of map we like to use, again, hopefully these are things you can Google and get more information because I know it's not doing its service to show you like five seconds of it, but service blueprints. Again, I'm assuming most of us are in the service industry and service blueprints are similar to journey maps where you map out the customer interaction, but the blueprint, the rest of the blueprints and map is based upon what's happening in the organization, what needs to be true for all this stuff to happen for the customer. So you're looking at customer's actions, you're looking at front stage activities, backstage activities, support processes. So you're mapping in order for the customer to do this, the server has to be able to do this and then the cook has to be able to do this. And you'll see that there's so many different uh, levels and ways that you can look at each stage. So front stage action could be like the wait staff, cashiers, flight attendants, kiosks, understanding all those front, we call it the line of visibility, what the customer can see. And then afterwards it's behind the scenes on backstage activities. So warehouse employees, cooks, wait staff in the kitchen. Those are all things and support, support processes are like uh, infrastructure, you know, you're talking about like uh, your databases, your quality assurance systems, things that need to be in place so your employees can have that experience. Service Blueprint is more about mapping the employee experience to the customer experience because you can't have one with the other. Sometimes they look like this when you're done and that typically looks like this when you're doing it in a workshop. So it's more just like creating some lines and then going, what is the customer doing? Okay, what's happening on the front line? What's happening on the back line? What's happening in support? It's something that it's great for an organization to take a look at to see what, how complicated one simple process is to onboard or to send person on a plane. Okay, so that was just the research side of things. So we do a lot of this at the very beginning to fully understand the user, their whole journey, uh, their pain points and their opportunities. So what happens after? Well, that's really the next stage we call identifying insights. Identifying insights is where everybody just gets together and writes down what they've heard. So you'll give some time to people to go, okay, let's look at all the research. Let's look at all, read all the transcripts. What are the themes? What are we seeing? And as a group, you'll start, you know, everybody's done this. It's like, okay, write things down on a post-it note. Let's put them up. Let's see similar things. You can affinity map them. You can cluster them how you want, however you want to do it. The whole point is to get some alignment. And the most important thing is to get cross-functional people to see it. So rather than just having one group of people, it's getting a bunch of different positions to see it. So then they feel that they might have impact over it. And from there, you can vote down what you think are the main challenges. What are the big problems that you need to focus as an organization? And that goes back down to the whole double diamond. So when you get to a certain point of voting these themes or these problems, it's then a, a chance for you to start defining the problem. It's, you'll, you might be just having these kind of up in the air themes that everybody thinks we need to solve this, but what you, before you need to go do some ideation and think of solutions, you need to really reframe these problems. And we like to call it reframing the problems because it's looking at the problem differently than you typically would. For an example, we like talking about the slow elevator. You might've heard this analogy before, but a lot of times people will say, well, the elevator is too slow. So that's maybe the insight they have at their, uh, their meetings. And so you instantly just go into the solution space of, well, in order to increase the speed, we just have to make the elevator faster. So it's all these expensive things like installing a new lift, upgrading the motor, improving the algorithm, things that are maybe more complicated, maybe more obvious. But if we reframe the problem, so, and ask, okay, so what's the problem if the elevator is too slow? Somebody might say, well, the weight's actually quite annoying. And we're like, oh, okay, well, that totally changes the whole narrative there. Maybe we can start looking at a different solution, like, oh, we'll make the weight feel shorter. Okay, so that's a totally different type of solution. And because of that, you'll come up with different ideas. And they came up with putting mirrors in the elevator. And as it turns out, people really like to look at themselves in the mirror. And so it allows people to forget the length of the time that they're in the elevator because they're potentially narcissistic. And we all can relate because if we're alone in an elevator, we know what we're doing, fixing our hair, maybe flexing. 
Okay. So this is that whole thing. You're coming down, you're reframing the problem, you're getting really close to the point and you really want to start going wide with the solutions. And you really want to start going, okay, let's throw some ideas. But right before we do that, we like to take those and reframe them with how might we statements. So kind of like how might we make the elevate, elevator ride feel shorter. And how might we statements are kind of popularized by IDEO. And I kind of say it sits about right here on that chart, right in the middle. So once you get a good how might we statement, that's a really good springboard for you to go create some solutions. How might we statements, they say every problem is an opportunity for design. By framing your challenge as a how might we question, you will be able to set yourself up for an innovative solution. And the more you get used to it, the more this will be part of your vocabulary and any problem you see in business, in life, you'll start going, how might we? It's really interesting. Let's take a quick sample. So pretend we did a lot of research and as a consultant for a restaurant and they said that ice cream sales are down at the drive-thru and they found out the reason is because people find it too messy on the go. So that's kind of the theme, the insight. And we said, let's try to solve this. Before we go into solutioning, we'll ask a how might we question. And sometimes you can be too broad or too narrow or too broad with it. So a too narrow of a how might we would be, how might we create a cone to eat ice cream without dripping? So the, obviously that's too narrow because it, it kind of prescribes the solution in the question saying that the cone is already the, the problem. Something that's too broad might be, how might we redesign dessert? And that's, that's going to open it up way too wide to like cakes, cookies, Skittles. Like you can, uh, you can if you want, but then you'll start realizing you, you're going to lack a lot of focus. But something in the middle, if you just find the right how might we, it feels just great. How might we redesign ice cream to be more portable? So right there, you're just talking about portability. And there it might, it's just enough that you feel like we could get some creativity in there, but it's not too narrow that it's going to you know, give everybody the same solution. So it, this takes a little bit of practice. So how might we statements, very big thing for us. And it's always the, the point before we start doing ideating, which gets us to ideation. And that's coming up with ideas. So pretend that we have a good how might we statement. This is where we go, okay, everybody, let's brainstorm. Let's, we have our focus. We're not brainstorming on things that don't matter. These are the things that matter the most to us. And again, no magic bullet in this. There's so many different ways to brainstorm. Um, we have our own methods. We have a ton of different activities. Um, we get people to sketch a lot. We love sketching. We love getting our clients to sketch. This is a really big activity for us just to make sure that they sketch, but they don't have to be Picassos. They just have to sketch to something like this where they can communicate it visually and maybe storyboard it. One we love doing is Crazy Eights where everybody has eight minutes to come up with eight ideas, eight different ideas, not a storyboard, eight different ideas on how to solve that one how might we statement. And they're fun and people get stressed out, but they know that their best ideas don't, isn't the first or second one. It's usually the third or fourth idea, which they weren't thinking of initially, but that time constraint really pushes them. And they don't have to be anything too crazy, something like this, which then goes into the next phase of trying out the best ideas. Cause you would present these ideas loosely. And then as a group, you would say, okay, let's, let's put some money on prototyping the one that we like. So you're going to come up with naughty ideas and say, let's prototype two of them. And that's where we get to the next phase of trying them out. And that really is what people think is prototyping. So we've had a lot of solutions. Now we're narrowing our solutions down to ones we're going to put a little bit of time and money into. And a lot of people, when they hear the word prototype, will think robot. And again, that's a, a misnomer for, for prototyping because really the way that we describe it is that it's just a prototype is a thing that anybody can look and respond to. It's very, very broad. Can you show a user something, an early piece of work to get some feedback? And it could be a, a nice sketch and just say, what do you think of this? Or something that's done in, in PowerPoint. This is like simply just a PowerPoint uh, wireframe. Or it could be an interface and spending maybe a day or two to kind of mock up something that's a little bit more visceral and engaging, but it's not tied to any backend. So there's no development, but it's just something that brought a little bit more real to the, to the consumer. Those are digital, but sometimes they could be um, not digital and offline. So this is an email for people on their first day of work. 
and prototyping it with new employees to go, hey, how does this feel if you read this? Does this make you more comfortable? Again, really, really simple. And sometimes they can be devices and physical gadgets, like my idea of Tinder meets Google Glass, where you can shake off or blink twice for yes or no. That one didn't make it past the prototype. But prototypes could also be role playing and everybody loves role playing, I know, but this is uh, an example of a coffee shop, you know, trying to mimic a coffee shop and understand, do they understand the, uh, the ordering system and do they know where to go and is this going to make their, their visit faster? Um, you can easily prototype this. This is done within an hour and got bringing a customer in to say, is this the way you're thinking? So prototypes, again, lots of different ways to explore those ideas. And then finally, it's getting some feedback and getting some feedback is just testing. And a lot of you have been familiar with testing, whether it's just a survey, but a lot of times we like to bring people in, look at some images, look at the story, tell them the story, get their feedback on it, or send something to a client so they can remote test it and they can click on it while we take notes. Going back to that mining thing, they wanted to create the, the tele remote system. So they're not even on the machine anymore. So we have to create like a, a virtual station for them to basically use it as an arcade. And th the very beginning, we had nothing. We just said, let's cut cardboard up and say, how many screens do you think you need? What do you need on this screen? Do you want it to be a click screen, touch screen, or do you want to use a joystick for your, your controls? And those are things that were just all open uh, to decide. And the engineers and the, the miners were really keen on giving us their feedback. So you can see like they're pipe cleaners. And then the second round of testing after we get a little bit of feedback is more just a, a simple interface. None of this is attached to the machine, obviously, because it's just like wood blocks and we're getting more feedback, a little bit more of a real situation and, and getting them to actually move things around and tell us exactly how they feel. And this is, this is true testing and iterative testing and prototyping. So testing can take so many, so, so many avenues and you don't have to be um, extremely like gifted at testing. It's more to show people and then get some feedback, hopefully have an insight from what, they, what they're seeing. So look at that. We talked about the research. We talked about how do you distill all that research into insights. We also talked about coming up with ideas, different ways to brainstorm and taking those brainstorms into a prototype phase and eventually taking those prototypes to test. That in itself is design thinking. And it's, it's a very powerful way to stop spinning your tires and start delivering, you know, designing your experiences around your customers, align your teams because you're always, you know, I keep saying that word cross-functional and also solving call complex problems within your organization, but bite size. So you're not boiling the ocean. You're doing something that is more about quick wins and creating and changing that siloed culture and hopefully future proofing your, your organization into the future. We've applied it to so many different ways from product service design process, change management, innovation, corporate vision, like we'll apply it to anything because we view it as a, a series of ingredients. Design thinking isn't this recipe, it's kind of these you know, loose phases and you can take the ideation thing and say, okay, we have enough research, let's just go right into ideation. Sometimes you just need to identify the problem. So whether you wanna take a little bit of it or a lot of it, it's, it's up to you. If you want a really prescribed way to do design thinking, this book right here is a good recommendation. It's written by Jake who used to work at Google and he developed this sprint methodology in Google, where it's, it's a very regimented, it's four days, it used to be five, where you, you basically map, sketch, decide, prototype, and test within those days on very specific things. And it's a really easy read, gives a lot of different business uh, uh, stories and case studies on how you can apply it. But that is something that's more like 15 minutes of this, then you go to an hour of this, then you go to 20 minutes of this, and you go to this. It's very, very prescribed. If you guys are still interested in some of the resources, um, these are some brands like AJ and Smart, IDEO, Google Ventures, Human Factors, Adaptive Path, which I don't know if is still around doing training, but uh, the NNG is just Nielsen Norman Group, which are kind of like with IDEO or the old organizations that really teach a lot of this stuff. But, but also know that in Saskatchewan, we are one of the only people that kind of teach this sort of stuff. And if you guys just read our blog, you kind of get some uh, ideas on how human-centered design works. Um, 
But as I said, this is part of the Bigger Zoo Academy. And so this is like, what, the 40 minute talk? There's a four hour version of this where we actually go through a lot of the activities and it's a smaller class size. And then if you're really interested and want to be a facilitator internally, or you really want to change your culture, we, there is that three to five day one, which is more called the intensive. Um, so you can get more information on that at z.com slash academy. But I, there's this training grant that's crazy right now, the return to work training grant, which is like, pretty much 100% sponsoring the trainings, but it closes in like three days. But the one that was prior to that still covered like 50 to 80%. So the we kind of specifically designed these three to five day ones to kind of fit the criteria. So you can get 50 to 100% uh, covered to take these week long trainings. So definitely. Uh, the the training, uh, the training grant is actually um, going to be extended to December. What? Oh yeah. man, we we rushed for no reason. No, 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 it's man, good. We so it's good wet. though. So people will have time to check out what you have to offer and um, hopefully uh, apply. So, is the training the application extended? Because I know the application was ending this month, but then you had four months basically to December. But now the application is. My understanding extended? is yes, um, but we have to wait for an announcement. Just just because, yeah, I just thought I would mention it because you know people are rushing to get it in in two days, which would be great too. Um, but there is time to, for uh, additional opportunities as well. So. Oh, so. great news. Insider information from Tourism Saskatchewan. Oh, I hope I'm not totally just <laughs> no, that's it. down it, the it, wrong path, but we, we did it, talk to them and they did say it's being extended. So. No, you heard it here first. It, it, it's written <laughs> in stone. You're, you're now liable for any sort of like cost. Yes, <laughs> yes, apparently. <laughs> Anyways, that, that's it for me. I, uh, I hope I wasn't too boring and I hope this stuff wasn't too, uh, too complicated. I just don't, I, it's just a lot to take in, in, in 40 minutes. Uh, but you feel, if you guys have any questions, just ask me now, ask me later, get a hold of me on any social channels. I don't check anything really other than my Facebook messenger, but like emailing is always the easiest if you have any questions. So. Awesome. Well, um, we're going to open it up for questions. If anybody has any questions, uh, you can put them in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, just give you a couple of minutes to do that. Um, in the meantime, though, I'll uh, kind of wrap up by saying thank you so much, Albert, for sharing everything. Um, it's always nice to get that uh, history of disruption and how we got here. I think we all kind of remember it, but it's great to have that reminder as well. Um, and thank you for stressing the importance of the user experience, which is always supposed to be front and center. Uh, you gave us some loose steps on how to kind of reimagine your business or your product or your service. Um, and also thanks for shedding some light on, on uh, how to put your customers at the center of your experience, which is really what we do in tourism. I, that is at the heart of what we do. Um, and I hope that you motivated, I know I'm motivated um, to try something new with my work and uh, for people to try something new with their business. Uh, there's a lot of really great things with design thinking and um, it's really useful to get together as a team and just have those discussions. So I think, I hope you've, you've sparked some of those uh, those things to move forward, so. Yeah, and it, even if you just start using how might we, I still feel like it's a success just to grab one or two things. Not everybody just applies the whole book. We rarely apply the entire book, but I always like making a little bit of change and, and pushing people a little out of their comfort zone, so. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I, uh, from my perspective, I especially like the idea of customer blueprinting or um, like the journey mapping stuff. I think that can be incredible. And that's, some, that's something I think we're going to be doing. We're going to be probably doing, I, I haven't really talked to the team, but I know we have enough material to do like a four hour thing on journey mapping, but it's sometimes good to take it with all the other course material so you know how it fits. Cause some people just take journey mapping and think that's all they need to do. But it's like, what do you do before? What do you do after? So. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, so I just have um, just a thank you. Uh, in the chat, um, but there doesn't seem to be any questions, but of course, um, you know where to find Albert, you know where to find me, and uh, thank you so much for joining us, and everybody, please take care. Awesome, thanks. Escape out of this thing. And